Why are living things the way that they are? Well, the answer is evolution. Every feature of every living organism on Earth is a result of its evolutionary history. In biology, any time you ask why an organism is the way that it is or how it got that way, the answer is going to be found in evolutionary biology. Evolution is pretty much the most interesting thing that has ever happened in the natural world. Life has taken a profoundly weird and remarkable journey over about the past three and a half billion years from mere disorganized scraps of molecules to the earliest forms of life that were very simple unicellular organisms to the remarkable and beautiful diversity that we see today blanketing practically the entire planet. It's a really wild story and any force that can bring about this kind of transformation must be extremely powerful. If all we could do when we learned about evolution was understand how we got here today, that would be plenty worthwhile. But studying evolution has some really practical uh, importance as well. So for example, why do bacteria evolve resistance to antibiotics? How do the necessary mutations occur? How do they spread? Can we prevent the evolution of resistance by using higher doses of antibiotics, lower doses, combinations of drugs? The answers to these questions could save thousands and thousands of lives if we get them right. Cancer, too, can be a matter of the out-of-control evolution of rogue cells in your body. And understanding how a cancer evolves can be key to stopping it. We're also very concerned about how species in the wild are evolving today. Evolution isn't just part of the deep past, it's happening now. Are wild species going to be able to evolve fast enough to keep up with things like global climate change? The fate of much of Earth's biodiversity could depend on the answer to that question. Before we start talking about what evolution is and how it works, um, I'd like you to think a little bit about what you think evolution is and how it works. Please stop the video and answer these questions. Hold on to your answers. You're going to want to refer back to them, potentially, for the rest of the semester. One of the difficult things about learning evolution is that a lot of people have already learned it badly. Almost everybody has heard about the theory of evolution, but much of what's floating around out in popular culture is actually wrong. There are a lot of misconceptions about what evolution is, how evolution and natural selection work. And people who study learning have discovered that when students have misconceptions, it's harder for them to learn a concept than it is if they had no prior knowledge about the concept at all. So um, what I want you to be doing during this course is thinking about what misconceptions you might have. And when you encounter some kind of conflict between the picture that you've got in your mind and the picture that you're being shown by the textbook or by me, really work to replace misconceptions with the correct conceptions. In particular for right now, you should realize that Every single one of the statements, the 10 statements that you just saw in question two, is incorrect in some important way. Um, if you agreed with any of those statements, it may be that you've got a significant misconception about how natural selection or how evolution work. Um, you want to be especially mindful of that and look for places during this section of the course when your understanding of evolution clashes with what you're being told. <clears throat> there are a lot of reasons why many people think incorrectly about evolution. Um, our brains are not really set up in a great way for understanding it. For one thing, we tend to think in categories. It's how we make sense of the complexity of the world around us. You may have heard of the idea of the platonic ideal. Uh, that's the idea that for something like, say, a chair, what's real is that there is somewhere out there this a perfect essence of chairness. And all the actual chairs that we see are just representations of this perfect chairness. Um, in other words, chairness is basically the category to which the individual chairs belong, and, and unconsciously we tend to think that the category is the real thing. 
In actuality, to understand how evolution works, you have to realize that there is no chairness. There are only chairs. And as the individual chairs come and go, or as they're replaced by others, the whole definition of what a chair is can actually shift. So that chairness doesn't stay as a fixed concept. The category doesn't actually stay the same because the variations between individual chairs matter. And as the individual chairs change, the definition of what it means to be a chair actually changes. This is how species work. Species are categories, but what's real are the individuals. And as individuals change generation after generation, the category itself can change, and it can change radically. This is not a way that most people are used to thinking about the world around them. Because we are individuals, we also tend to think of individuals as what is really important. We tend to think in terms of narratives with you know, starring characters. Um, in evolution, however, individuals actually don't change. This is an idea, what you're seeing on the screen here, is an idea called Lamarckism. The idea that individuals change phenotypically, they change their appearance or behavior over their lifespan, and that those changes are inherited by their offspring. Lamarck thought, well, maybe that's how organisms get better at dealing with their environment. They change during their lifetime, those changes are inherited, and so their offspring become better at dealing with the challenges of life. In fact, that's not how it works. What happens is not an individual changing over its lifespan, but a population changing as generations go by. Giraffes might start out as these kind of short, stumpy things, and then um, say if it's better to be tall, if it helps them survive and uh, to be tall, then the next generation might be a little taller, the next generation taller still, and so on. What you end up with is a population that's very different than what you started with. But no individuals have changed. Certain individuals have simply been replaced by others. Short individuals have been replaced by tall ones. We're not used to thinking like that either. Another reason that evolution is difficult to think about is because the spans of time are so huge that our brains can't really grasp them. So for example, if you were going to go out looking for fossils of whales, do you know where you would find them? Strangely, a lot of the best fossil finds that tell us about the evolutionary history of whales have been found in Pakistan, uh, very, very high up in the Himalayas. So for example, this is one of the um, ancestral organisms somewhere on the family tree of early whales. Um, and it was found uh, by um, a scientist named Owen Gingrich up in the Himalayan mountains. This doesn't seem like the place where you would find fossil sea organisms. <clears throat> but what has happened is that these organisms, they lived so long ago um, in this area here called the Tethys Sea. Uh, this was so long ago that the world has changed immensely since then. Specifically what happened is that the subcontinent of India floated slowly course through, uh, northward through plate tectonics rammed into the Asian tectonic plate and lifted the Tethys Sea up into the highest mountains on Earth. Okay, this is almost unimaginable for us because our minds are calibrated to think in terms of years, not centuries, not millennia, and certainly not millions of years. But those are the spans of time we have to think about to understand evolution. Finally, and, and this is probably the most common misconception that people have, is we tend to think about evolution as a process that has a goal or a purpose. We are essentially engineers. We design stuff. We have a vision, a plan, and we put it into action. And that's how we tend to think about evolution. We tend to think as organisms as evolving toward a finished product. And this is, in particular, the image that you usually see when you think about evolution. And this is the single picture that most people think of when they think about um, evolutionary biology. You know, see, it's, you know, in popular culture, it's become the basis for all sorts of jokes. Um, <clears throat> but even though it's very popular, it's very widely known, it is totally wrong as far as a conception of evolution. 
This is what, for example, the evolution of modern human beings from more ape-like ancestors looks like. It's not this um, directional, very neat orderly progression. It's this branching tree that goes all over the place. It tries all sorts of new things. Uh, things come up, they go extinct, they change back and forth in unpredictable ways. And this up here, Homo sapiens, modern humans, are not an end product. Just like any of these other organisms along the way, they are a stepping stone. Um, we are a brief moment in the evolution of this long, long lineage that has been around for three and a half billion years. And we are no more the goal or end point of that process than any of the other organisms that have been alive during that whole span of time. Organisms also don't evolve by wanting to evolve. Uh, there are mechanisms that cause uh, organisms to evolve, but they are not the kind of mechanisms that have goals. Uh, there is natural, natural and non-goal oriented as what happens when you let go of a rock and it falls to the ground. They're very natural forces, and we'll explain these. But it's very compelling for us to think about evolution as something that has a reason, a plan, a goal. Some of the misunderstandings about evolution are reinforced by the way that it's talked about in popular culture. Uh, oftentimes, you'll find that there's a word that has a common meaning, a sort of everyday meaning, but then that word is used in a much more specific and somewhat different way in science, and evolution is one of those terms. If you look in the dictionary, um, you'll find that these are definitions that are given for the term evolution, um, but these are the popular meanings. What these are talking about, these um, when you're using evolution in this sort of popular sense, what you're talking about is the unrolling of a plan or a change that maybe is moving toward a goal. And that can be confusing because then people think of biological evolution as moving toward a goal. But biological ev evolution has a very specific and somewhat different meaning. In fact, it has two meanings, um, which you should get used to. One of them, uh, when we say, say the evolution of vertebrates or the evolution of modern insects, what we're talking about is an evolutionary history. Um, what happened over time to change previous organisms so that they were more like organisms that we see today. The term evolution is also used to talk about the mechanisms that change populations over time. Things like mutation, natural selection, genetic drift, and so on we are mostly going to be talking about those mechanisms. So when we talk about evolution, mostly what we're going to be talking about in this class are the processes or the mechanisms by which living organisms evolve.